Welcome back to the Never Know Podcast. My name is Ryland. I'm Daniel. Uh, it's been a while since we've uh, since we've recorded an episode. It's been uh, about a month. Yeah, about a month. Our longest hiatus yet. But uh, I think we got a really good guest in store today. Worth He's, the wait. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I've been trying to get this one going for probably about a month now too. Um, president of Momentum and Four App Sports. Please welcome Tosh Semlacher. Did I say that right? Yeah, you did. You cool. Did great. What's up, Tosh? How we doing? Doing well. So yeah, just, uh, just another day. I appreciate it. Another day. Are you uh, are you at the office already doing a podcast from the office? Yes, I am. Nice. I'm out in nice. the uh, the one room that has doors right now, so it's <laughs> the only the quiet room. I was going to say that building. If it's the same building I've been watching, it's been under construction since spring training of last year. So yeah, uh, I was supposed to be ready for spring training of last year, but uh, <laughs> construction's kind of hard right now. So. Yeah. I figured. Well, uh, let's get right into the pod. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, kind of your background, where you came from, you know, childhood growing up, how you got into, you know, baseball and all that kind of stuff. Sure. Yeah. So uh, I was born in Calgary, Alberta, Canada uh, in 1992. And uh, I moved to Vancouver when I was two years old. So my mom and dad, they were both in medicine. Uh, My mom was an emergency room nurse. My dad was a plastic surgeon. Um, And so Basically, they moved to Vancouver because that was where a majority of our family was living at the time. Uh, that's where my dad was from. So I lived there until I was about seven. Um, when my sister was born, she's a couple of years older than me. Uh, my parents decided they wanted to move to the United States, uh, you know, just for better opportunities for us. Um, and that was, I would say, the, the first major thing that I saw, like, as a dream, um, I'm lucky enough that both of my parents are extremely driven people and very talented people and they were able to make it happen. Uh, I think it took a lot longer than they uh, thought it would, but um, we got here in 1999, moved to Sacramento, California. Uh, and yeah, that was the, uh, my dad had to switch specialties from being a cardiac surgeon in Canada to being a plastic surgeon out here. So he's currently a plastic surgeon out in Washington now. Um, but that was, you know, the real start to my life, uh, being an immigrant kid. Uh, a lot of people wouldn't expect it to be that different coming from Canada to the United States. But to be honest, it's really framed who I am. Um, I, you know, as you knew that you were kind of different, you had different experiences. You were constantly going between two different countries. You had to go through, uh, you know, to go see your grandparents and your aunts and uncles. They're in a totally different country. You'd have to go through customs you have to go all this different stuff and it was a recurring trip so that was kind of that's always framed kind of who i am um the whole idea of the american dream is it continues to be probably one of the biggest uh inspirations for me especially for you know the things i do and what i try to achieve and obviously now that i'm able to kind of pursue the career i have in baseball uh it's something i don't take for granted so um basically Grew up, I'd say my, I grew up in Sacramento, California, which is actually a pretty strong, uh, strong hub for baseball players. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think California in general is a strong baseball. No, exactly. Uh, But I would actually like, it's kind of funny. People from Sacramento, uh, it's, it's this thing you, in the kind of surrounding areas, whether it be Elk Grove or Carmichael or a few other small kind of suburbs in that area, you have a bunch of major leaguers. You have like Nick Madrigal, you have Rowdy Telez, you have Reese Hoskins. Um, you have a bunch of different guys that have come before then. Uh, and it's this just, you know, no one really thinks of Sacramento as a, a hub for baseball, but um, lucky enough, I was able to grow up out there. I actually didn't really play baseball until college. Uh, I played little league. I tried out my freshman year of high school uh, but I ended up doing track uh, for my entire high school career, won a state championship in, uh, in track my senior year at Jesuit High School. Um, and that was, you know, I, I found, went through hardships during that. Uh, the, the high school I was going to was a juggernaut in baseball, and I wasn't good enough to play baseball at that point. I'm in apparently. the same boat, the exact yeah. same boat. And so I ended up doing track. Um, but I had some people that truly believed in my skills and, you know, they're like, you know, you should play baseball because you want to be a professional athlete. And though you're a very good athlete, that was the one thing that I did always kind of have going for me is that 
I was always generally a better athlete than most people. I was just also small. When I moved to the United States, um, they wanted me to be kind of held back uh, a grade and I didn't. And so I was ultimately just younger than everybody. And so you'd go through these ebbs and flows where sometimes you were the tallest kid. Sometimes you were way smaller. Uh, I was five, four in eighth grade, five, five, um, got to high school at five, five, like 97 pounds. Uh, so I honestly, if you were to try to put me on a competitive baseball team, I don't think I would pick myself at that point either. Um, but obviously as things progressed, I'm six, four, two twenty Now I left college at around six, four left high school at six foot. Uh, so, I mean, this is actually my experience is framed exactly why I went to the career I did, you know, the whole player development side, the whole idea of like trying to help athletes negotiate and present their value, even if people aren't seeing it anecdotally or in the way they, they used to. So, um, yeah, basically went from track to baseball in college, uh, was a shortstop my freshman year, but then got moved to third base, started freshman year on. I went to school uh, in Oregon called Willamette University, uh, which is a D3, uh, D3 school out in Salem, Oregon. Um, played well, at, at least enough to start. Started to learn the game a bit more. Uh, realized that I was not going to be a professional baseball player as an infielder. So uh, my between my sophomore and junior year, the summer, I decided that I was going to basically become an outfielder. I called my coach and said, hey, the summer ball team I'm playing for, I told them I'm an outfielder and I'm coming back an outfielder. Uh, and so he's like, okay. I say, so how do you take that? Big... That was just out of the uh, blue. I had a pretty, you know, this is this has played a role in my whatever career I was pursuing at the time. Um, I've always been pretty forthright with like, this is where I'm heading. Uh, and if I make a decision, it's like, this is where we're going. And my... I had a pretty interesting relationship with my college baseball coach because he was generally my first real baseball coach I ever had. Um, and I don't think I was indoctrinated to listen to everything he had to say. And I pushed back pretty hard where I was just like, I'm not as good as I want to be as an infielder. And to be honest, at that point, I was only getting worse. I could always hit. That was the only reason I was still in the lineup. Um, hitting was always something that came very naturally to me, but I just had a bunch of raw skills out in the field and I just didn't know where to put it. So in my mind, I talked to a bunch of different people. Um, there's actually, there's a couple two main people that were really kind of uh, significant in my baseball career. There's a guy named Lloyd Mosby who played center fielder for, uh, he was a center fielder for the Blue Jays for 11 years, right before they won the World Series uh, in the 80s. Um, he's like my second dad. He's kind of like my baseball dad. And he's the one who, really helped me uh, kind of understand my value from a baseball standpoint. But he also was like, you know, you're fast, you can throw hard. Um, let's just force your hand and put you in the outfield. And I, I'm pretty sure you'll become a better baseball player then. So we did that. My, that summer I killed it, started hitting home runs. I stopped believing in like, okay, I'm fast. Let's put the ball in play. I started thinking I, I, I want to do damage. You know, the whole kind of evolution of the game that's going on right now yep. is exactly what I went through in 2011 or yeah, 2012. Um, and it's just like out of necessity because I wasn't, the only reason I went to that school uh, was to pursue baseball and to become a better baseball player. I could have gone, I was basically in line to go to track or go to Yale to do track. I was going to say, uh, what, how athlete. are you, how are you academically? Like, were you a fairly smart kid? Like, yeah, school, school was always pretty straightforward for me. Uh, you, I go ahead. Go, what did you, what did you go to college for? So I initially, this is always a funny thing. Um, so my dad was a physics major before he became a doctor. Physics was really something I understood and, kind of really liked in high school um, and just came easy to me. So I was sitting there and being like, okay, I'm going to do physics. And then my freshman year, I had physics. I had the whole thing lined up where like, if baseball doesn't work out, I'll become a doctor, um, which always makes me laugh because it's <laughs> not that easy. Um, but then I started missing practices because of labs. I, it was very clear that I was going to miss out on a lot of things that I wanted to do. Uh, and then I also just had a very frank conversation with my dad. I was like, yeah, you know, you like sleep. 
It's like, I do. Um, <laughs> you like baseball? I'm like, I do. It's like, well, those are things you have to sacrifice to really pursue this. So I was like, okay. Um, so I ended up going into uh, a degree called Rhetoric and Media Studies, which is basically communications at yep. a liberal arts school. It's, I think it's called Civic Communications and Media now. Um, it really, I mean... The biggest thing for me is that I wanted to find a degree that I could apply to literally any occupation I did. Communications um, is the one. Yep. And it, it was one of these things where, you know, some of the most successful people I know are all communications majors. And it's because they allowed, especially in the world we live in now, um, being flexible and being able to communicate in a way that's pretty effective. That is needed in any profession. You know, um, before I came back into baseball, after my professional baseball career kind of ended, uh, that was, I was thinking of going in the military. And that was one of the biggest things they wanted out of their leaders. Um, people who have college degrees and people who would be, you know, officers immediately. Um, they wanted people who were effective communicators. And it's like, well, I'm glad I learned something about that rather than studying things that, you know, I still look into science stuff. I still enjoy watching things about physics and all the things like sure. I grew up in a medical household, biology. My sister studied the same thing. Um, so she wanted to be a PA. So it's, I've always been surrounded by that stuff. Um, but yeah, ultimately ended up communications route, uh, which for me was the ideal way of going about it. And it was one of the better degrees at the school out of that. So did you, uh, did you ever consider like sports medicine then? Cause it's kind of the best of both worlds. Um, you know, I did, uh, but it also became one of those, I spent way too much time with PTs. I spent way too much time in the, you know, the trainer's room. Uh, and it, it was something that came up all the time, but then I just realized that, you know, I never wanted to be on the other side of it. I just wanted to be in my mind. It was one track mind, especially in college. Anybody who knew me in college, um, I had one thing on my mind. I wasn't the biggest socialite. I was, I was actually considered a ghost on campus. Um, like I would pop in for class and then pop out and then I'd be at practice. And then I, I, that was basically me, uh, for all four years. So, um, it was really, it was something I'm definitely interested in. And it's something I learned way more about just from my own injuries, which ultimately is what ended my career, like playing wise. Um, but yeah, it's, it just became like, I had to be very frank with what my talents are and where my focuses are and my passions. And, you know, I can serve others in other ways. Um, and that became my true kind of calling in that regard. Cool. So, um, yeah. so then jump forward a little bit, you graduate college, you have your comm slash media degree. Uh, yeah. like where, where do you go? Cause obviously you're done playing baseball. Sounds like do you not yet, not uh, yet, not yet. So basically my junior year I go and, um, I'm invited to this thing. Well, I guess at the beginning of my senior year, I'm invited to this thing called T12, which is the All-American game for Canada. Uh, it's based in Toronto. Um, it was the inaugural one. So it was like me, Mike Soroka, Josh Naylor. Uh, oh, no way. That's pretty a few, sweet. A few other like major Canadians that, you know, at this point, I'm one of the older guys. Me and Mike Soroka were actually the oldest guys there. I think we were both 21. Um, and just like different provinces get invited. And at this point, no one knew me. I'd never played baseball in Canada before. Uh, so no one knew who I was. It actually, it came up multiple times in it, like a couple interviews where, you know, some of the guys were like, you know, I, you're good, but who are you? Kind of yeah. thing, right? Have you seen so, that new, uh, that new Adam Sandler movie on Netflix? It's like the same exact story. It's like some random mm -hmm. basketball player from, I think he's from Columbia and he comes into the league and he just dominates everyone. Like he's taking out all sweet. these NBA players and he's like, who is this guy? Oh, awesome. I know that the actor, I think one of the main actors in that, uh, he played baseball for the Red Sox. I did see that. Oh, really? And so this is like his second career as being an actor. Oh, that's pretty cool. Uh, but that's kind of what it was like. You know, I, uh, I had been spending the last three years. I mean, I didn't, I rarely took a day off. It was just, I was always in the weight room trying to learn more baseball. I was constantly playing. I was traveling around, you know, playing in the Cal Collegiate League. I was doing all this other stuff. To be honest, my in-season stuff during school wasn't, to me, competitive baseball. I was a worse D3 baseball player than I was like a summer ball player playing against high-level teams. Like, it's just one of those things where, you know, playing against better teams, I guess I would try to play better and that sort of thing. Sure. And also, you know, for me, hitting was always about timing. 
and I would uh, get thrown off pretty, pretty strongly by guys throwing a little slower, and I'd be sitting there with a huge leg kick and kind of just be off time. So, are we talking like a Justin um, Turner leg kick, or? Yep. There's yeah. a there's a few pictures of me in college where my leg is literally like the guy's throwing it, and my leg is almost at my shoulder. <laughs> that's that's just kind of how I adapted. But the um, go and do this thing at T12. I have a really good showing. Uh, they had a combine there that you know I threw a hundred from the outfield. I ran a really fast sixty. Uh, I hit really well, um, and so that put me on a list. They had all like all thirty teams there. Every scout knew who I was after that point. My my career trajectory changed that after that kind of ten day span. What is your um, what's your like mental state after like performing really well at something like that? Like, are you on like a pretty like a good high then, or like are you just kind of still playing it cool? Like, I've, I've always tried to remain somewhat in the middle. It was more validating than anything. Okay. I, was, I felt, you know, my um, my sister actually before I even got into sports, my sister was a high level figure skater. Um, so she's trained with Michelle Kwan, and her coach was Frank Carroll, and like her whole life was kind of focused on professional figure skating. Uh, And I saw her go through things where she had, you know, really strong performances at high levels and then very poor performances at high levels. And I just remember seeing the ups and downs of that. And I just remember like noticing at a very young age being like, I can't kind of, my mental state can't function in a way that's like a roller coaster. I just got to remain as kind of uh, even as possible. So at that point I was obviously happy. Um, It was something that if it was a good feeling and, you know, it's pretty cool to be a 21 year old kid with my dad had never really seen me play at that sort of level before. Um, and it's just me and him in Canada, like the country we had left. And I was performing at, you know, one of the highest levels of amateur baseball at that point. Uh, and I did really well. So I, I felt good, but it was really, I can look back at it and being like, you know, I am like my dream of pursuing professional baseball is like a legit thing. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't just a figment of my imagination kind of thing. So that's that's kind of where my mindset was at on that. It was kind of like a life life comes full circle moment in a way, you know, being from Canada and then coming here, playing baseball, and then you end up in Canada getting all this attention from scouts and stuff like that. Yeah, it was, it was actually really funny how, I mean, the Blue Jays hadn't really talked to me at all, but obviously one of the most, you know, significant people in my baseball career is a Blue Jays guy. Um, and so, maybe, like, I'll always – have love for the Blue Jays organization because they literally gave me every opportunity possible to be a professional baseball player. Even, you know, a few years later down the road when my shoulders just torn to hell, uh, they were still doing what they could to try and give me an opportunity. So yeah, after that, I come back, play the season. And in the middle of my senior season, my left shoulder just starts popping out and subluxing constantly. So, you know, like Fernando Tatis, Yep. uh, how his shoulder on swings kept popping out yeah. constantly. That's the exact injury I had. Okay. Um, and I feel for him, you know, yeah. it's not something that it doesn't get better. No, uh, definitely not. So I played through that. I, at this point I have an agent. Um, I have an advisor, like he's helping me through this whole process. You know, he's getting me to go to workouts uh, with Michael Conforto and a bunch of the other, like, and you're still in college, college during this? Yeah. So I'm still <laughs> – I'm uh, I'm the only D3 guy for sure at these workouts with a bunch of Oregon State guys and UW <laughs> guys. Yeah. Um, it's it's pretty fun. You know, you, you walk in there and you see these people that you've heard about and, like, the media coverage we had at uh, Salem, Oregon, at a D3 school is in the very high. So you'd be like, oh, I know who you are. Yeah. But then they'd be like, yeah, I'm not a clue who you are. Like, <laughs> That's pretty naturally. funny. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so shoulder goes to hell, uh, make the decision to play. I end up going from my first series, we were playing Chapman in California, and I had 12 cross checkers there. I had a bunch of guys like there for me specifically. Um, and during that series is when my shoulder first popped out. Uh, uh, and then at the end of the year, I ended up having, you know, I think it was four teams at my pro day, which I still consider a success. Yeah. Uh, because no one knew who's like where Salem, Oregon was at that point. Like, you know, I can't remember. Actually, the last guy to get drafted out of my school was my agent. Uh, oh, really? This is a pretty cool. It was a pretty cool story at that point. Um, now, are yeah, you paying so, for an agent like in college? Like, 
How does a school provide one? How does that work? So basically they, they stand as an advisor. So they're basically, uh, he, my agent, his name was Nick Lubasich, uh, Northwest sports management group. He's got like Nick McKinstry now and, uh, Ryan Thompson, like the, sure. the righty for the Rays. Like great dude. He's taking a lot of guys under his wing in the same capacity that he did with me. Um, you know, I say this now, but like we did have a bit of a falling out just for this more on my end. Cause I was just upset with how my career ended. Sure. Um, we've been able to amend some things kind of, uh, but he, at that point, basically, and it's just an advisor you sign on it's they're there to help you get to where you want to be. And so they, you know, they're able to help you go to workouts. They're able to, you know, help you talk with scouts. Um, and I could say that it's one of the biggest things for me was those experiences is like, I started to see my communications, you know, major in play where I was able to communicate what I wanted and who I was in a much better way to some of these really significant people who are interviewing you. Uh, and that was my first major interviews for a job. And I could say like, I never have really had a formal job interview. Sure. Um, that's not, I've, I've had one when I was trying to have a side job when I was still trying to pursue my job uh, or my professional baseball career. But I ended up losing that uh, job to my brother-in-law. Uh, <laughs> So that's, that's story. always the running joke. I know, right? Um, but yeah, advisors, basically, that's what they do. It's it's very independent of the school. Um, but then basically what they do is like, you know, they're not taking any money. They're not taking anything like that. You sign basically something for them to like, they can speak on your behalf um, and call people. And then basically the gentleman's agreement is that as you like build your career and as you have more contracts come through, most don't take you know, any money for the minor league side, unless you're getting these big bonuses. Sure. That's when like, you know, the big agents, they serve as advisors and they get a piece of that. Um, but guys in this situation, especially for me, I was, <laughs> it's partially why I wasn't able to sign a contract was, you know, the surgery that I was going to have to pay was going to be uh, more money than they were going to pay me. Yeah. And so he would, he would never want to take a percentage of, you know, $2,000 and a cup of coffee and a plane ticket to Arizona, Florida. Definitely. So, um, that's, that's how that works. Okay, cool. Yeah. So we'll jump forward a little bit here. Uh, shoulder goes to hell. Uh, I mm -hmm. assume when you, what, what career came for was four app sports first or is four app under the whole outage tree? So there's a bit of a piece of, I go to driveline baseball actually. Okay. Um, I didn't know you yeah, worked for, so, for driveline. Oh yeah. So this is the way things really changed. Um, so I end up going, I have a few pre-draft workouts for the Tigers, the Red Sox and Blue Jays. Um, I have surgery, heal up, try to come back. Everyone's afraid to sign me just because they know that my shoulders are taking time bomb. And so I could always throw really hard. Uh, so a guy named Casey Weathers, basically he's, he was like a big brother to me, another Sacramento guy. Um, and he's like, hey, you know, don't you dare quit. You can always throw hard, come out here to Seattle um and learn how to pitch and you know he called me a few choice words when i was like you know i really just think i might want to do something else and he's like nah you, I, I expect to see you out here kind of thing um so that was enough for me to move my life out to the northwest uh from sacramento i needed a change um and so get out there and you know this is when driveline had seven clients okay. maybe four four employees it's like towards the know. very beginning then Yep. This is, uh, this is 2016. Okay. Um, and so I start spending a lot of time there. You know, the, one of the first main off seasons I have, I get there in September. And so the off season obviously starts, uh, November ish time. So you have Trevor Bauer, who obviously a business partner of mine now, um, you know, he comes through, uh, takes, you know, he's one of the most generous people with his time, with his thoughts, with, you know, just trying to change the game. I'd say he's probably, within the last 50 years, probably one of the most uh, kind of significant figures in the evolution of the game, just yeah. what he's been able to create and do. And that started for me at driveline. I didn't get to see it before then, but you know, it started, I guess I did see it in videos when he was doing like Jager bands and he was the, the main the, figurehead of that. The, uh, the uh, weird oh, pole above his head when, dude, that went so viral. Oh, yeah. It was nuts. And so, yep. Um, 
but he's there. And then obviously, you know, this is, it's part of what we're like creating again here is driveline back in the day was a very, uh, it was a safe haven for guys who wanted to think about doing more in the game of baseball rather than just be good. Uh, you know, it, it, it was a few guys that, you know, Eric Sim was there with me who obviously yep. I've known him now and he's turned into what he is, but he was trying to pursue the same things we were, you know, it was just a bunch of ragtag dudes and we'd get there at 11 PM or 11 AM. We'd throw, uh, we'd lift, we would do a bunch of pretty, you know, a lot of people thought was outlandish workouts, but it started to work. Then, you know, you had figureheads like Kyle Bodie, um, who really strong leader, really strong, uh, you know, inspirational guy that, you know, a lot of the people that I helped build, I was at driveline for five years. Uh, I became a throwing trainer there in the early days. Um, then I moved to the business side when I went and got my MBA in sports business at Seattle U. Um, I'm on the, the board of directors now, uh, or the advisory board for that program now. That's sweet. Um, uh, but like, so I moved to the business side, helped them build the, like did a whole rebranding thing, tried to, you know, boost, uh, international kind of expansion, did a bunch of that. Um, and luckily I've, I've been able to meet a lot of really cool people who came through that kind of that hub. Yeah. Considering just what sort of things, it was a very inspirational place. You know, you have Sam Breen, who's with the Yankees now. He was a massive, uh, massive piece in driveline becoming what it is. Guys like Colby Suggs, who's a bullpen coach now for the Twins. Um, you know, the, the amount of people that went through the early days of driveline uh, and the significant people they are now in the game of baseball. Um, I'd say that's really where, even though my baseball career ended, uh, so surprise, wasn't a great pitcher. Threw hard, could throw hard for maybe like six pitches, and that was it. <laughs> um, this was like my completion of my baseball career because I was becoming a significant figure in a way that the people I was around and the things we were accomplishing together uh, really enabled me to do that. So that's basically up until, you know, 2020, I was at driveline. Okay. Um, so you were at driveline to, then until 2020. So then, okay. Then I assume Trevor Bauer comes to you then and was like, or how, how did that start up? So we've, we've always, um, when we first met in 2016, we, we always kind of hit it off. Um, you know, there's, I like to, in some capacities, I like to think of myself as a steadfast person and very principled person. Um, and it's very rare that, you know, I find people that I truly see that in, but kind of see those qualities in other people. And I constantly saw that in him, um, you know, just the way that he'd handle himself and the way that he'd come in and be super generous with his time and his thoughts. And then the same way he'd treat the game of baseball while he was playing at the biggest stage possible um, was, you know, didn't care if the massive organization, whether it be the team he was playing for or obviously MLB, you know, was against what he was saying. He was calling them out on just being honest. That's all he wanted yeah. was transparency, honesty, um, throughout whatever situation that might have been at the time. Um, and then, you know, when it came to his very advanced thinking of, you know, where the game's heading and where it needs to be, he was always, he's always been three or four steps ahead. And so that was a major inspiration for me. And this is where, you know, my interest in physics, my interest in biology, my interest in medicine, my interest in physiology, all these things um, that I tried to implement in me kind of in a concentrated dose to become a professional baseball player. That's something we'd always talked about. So um, for years, we'd always been like, you know, maybe we should always just, maybe we should build something for ourselves um, and build things that we really cared about. And so that's where, you know, I had seen kind of what I, I in my mind, the, the days of, it was time for me to have something new. It was time for me to, I, would, I needed to do something bigger for me. Um, and so I left driveline in August of 2020. Um, basically I got through COVID you know, it seemed like things were on the up and up uh, again, and they were doing fine. So uh, I left, took a little bit of time to think about what I wanted to do. There's a few other opportunities that were clear, but I didn't really want to go the corporate route. Um, it was really clear to me that small business is something that really matters to me. I have the flexibility to be whoever I want to be. And if I can own that, um, then I can do what I want to do. And so that's where me and him got together, obviously momentum. Um, that's been our biggest thing uh, is really allowing people to care about baseball in a fun way. 
um, irregardless of, you know, the largest uh, entities in the sport, whether they like it or not, uh, you know, giving athletes a voice. This is what, no matter what I do, um, I've realized that my main goal in my professional careers in this light is to empower athletes to achieve as much as they can to, you know, own all of what they build. Um, you know, it's, it's something I learned along the way that athletes are taken advantage of constantly. Um, they don't ever get the fair shake. You know, it's the same thing with the CBA, this, you know, this lockout solved nothing. No. Um, and so like, there's a lot of things like that, that I'm going to consistently in, you know, private sector, third party, I can do what I can do for athletes that care. And the, the cool part is the last two years that we've been doing this, you've, you've got a lot more athletes starting to see this. Um, you have a lot more young athletes, whether they be high schoolers, college kids, young minor leaguers that just don't like the way the system is. They're starting to see how you can represent yourself in media in different ways. You don't have to wait for the media to decide for you to have a spotlight. Um, yeah. and, then, and then when it comes to 4-App, it was kind of in the same light. Um, you know, it's, it's the first major, we wanted to create a front office that represents the player and the player alone and supports them rather than, you know, the organizations that employ them. So we wanted to spend a lot of money and invest a lot of money in tools um, uh, that basically we're able to give to the general public and give to minor leaguers and major leaguers at, that their team, if they want to give access to, they can. Um, the, the information they receive, but ultimately I want that to be the athlete's choice. Um, I want them to have full ownership of the data that they're collecting on themselves. And so that all started, a lot of the inspiration came from my understanding and growth at driveline. Um, my biggest thing was owning your career, owning your data, empowering athletes. Uh, and that's basically, I wanted to, with the different endeavors that we really pursue now, um, no matter what we do, that's always the main focus. So that's for both momentum and for app. Yeah. Um, so speaking about momentum specifically, you talked about, you know, it's, it's a company that's there to help empower athletes and, you know, specifically baseball players. Can you go a little more in depth about like what momentum is exactly what you guys do and, um, how sure. it actually helps, you know, empower the athletes? Absolutely. So, uh, momentum's a media company that, you know, that, that is a very, uh, fluid statement in society today because you do everything. Right. Um, we've in the last year or so transitioned more into like influencer type content um where you know this has been it's one of the main focuses i, I can say this is one of the directions that i was less um experienced in but always extremely interested in because it's ultimately the part that influences the most yeah. um and so the way that momentum started with taiki and trevor um, was that they wanted to find a way to empower athletes to tell their story and tell their narrative. Uh, and obviously one of the biggest spearheads of that was Trevor, because, you know, there's, there's been very few people in baseball um, that have had the media try to misconstrue who they are and what they've accomplished more than for Trevor. Um, and so he wanted to take that and present it to the world in his own light. Like this is the true story and this is coming from me. Oh, it was the best so with his camera walking around. That was the, those are the best videos ever. Like that's that's what we want to enable athletes to have. Um, and the honest truth is, obviously, it's it's something that is still uh, significantly monitored by organizations. So it becomes harder for athletes to do that. And you know, this is one of the reasons why I respect Trevor as much as I do. Is that he's like, this is the right thing to do. This is the right thing to do for the gen future generations of the game. This is allowing them to, you know, have more control and speak their, speak their mind. And, you know, we always talk about how in society we want to have general free speech and the ability to represent ourselves truthfully and like just have people being held accountable for things that are wrong and for things that are right and all these things. And that's generally what momentum was made to do initially. Um, and so a lot of the content with that was mic'd up content. It was, you know, having certain athletes come on and have interviews and then have really cool content in that regard. Um, and then as things have progressed, now we've moved more towards the influencer side where obviously, you know, Trevor's a massive influencer in the space. Uh, Eric Sim, I'd say was our first major case study of if we'd be good at this, um, which I think we've had pretty strong success. And luckily, you know, the guy's just an absolute workhorse. He's one of the better friends I have, which, you know, it's and he's a good personality. Like he's just fun to watch. 
Yeah. And you know, it's, it's really one of those authenticity things. Um, you know, he's a, a polarizing figure. And the truth is when it comes to influence, like actual influence, polarization is one of the most important things. You just have to make sure that what you're moving towards is the right thing for you. Um, and it's, it's been a big thing. So we've wanted to just continue to start creating a lot more fun content for people to consume. And we've seen that YouTube, uh, is a very strong medium for it. It allows for Huge. you know a lot of people to, the big thing is I want to inspire kids to be better adults and be better athletes and be more well-adjusted and to also stand up for something. Um, especially in a, you know, baseball hasn't really changed much. Not at all. Over the last, uh, I mean, maybe over the last year or two with Trevor carrying around a camera and then you see, uh, who is it? Trevor on the Mets, uh, not Trevor Rogers. Trevor May. Trevor May. He's doing his yeah. little vlog series. Like, it kind of started that wave of like, you know, let's go yeah. behind the scenes and see, like, you know, what are they eating in yes. the clubhouse? What are they doing at the hotel? That kind of stuff. What What are they talking about during BP? Like, yeah, I was uh, absolutely. I, I was curious because I know with a platform or a company like Momentum, some of like big mm -hmm. organizations like an MLB, they might be kind of concerned or a little like peek their head in and be like, you know, what exactly are you guys doing here? Giving them their own platform, you know. Do you, have you had um, the MLB, like, overall or any of the teams kind of reach out to you guys and kind of do some fishing and be like, so what exactly are you guys doing? Um, and try to um, almost be like a helicopter parent. You know, they're, they're always paying attention, I can say that. Um, they, I would say, organize, luckily, organizations operate independently, somewhat of MLB. Um, you know, we've dealt with some really good people at different organizations that they're super excited about what we do for the game. Um and they see it holistically, like baseball is baseball and there's a bunch of communities about it. There's a bunch of people that make up that. To me, baseball is one of the best communities ever. Um, it's a very welcoming place for the most part. It's divided in some capacities, but what, you know, community isn't. You have to, but it has the ability to have somewhat graceful conversations, not on Twitter. Yeah. I don't, I'm not saying this on Twitter, uh, but like for the most part, when people are in person, when you see them at conferences, um, they generally, baseball is a great community of very supportive people. And so, uh, I would say that for the most part to answer it directly, they definitely pay attention. Um, you can see a lot of, you know, things that we did two or three years ago, uh, have started to be kind of, you know, certain channels were made from MLB to represent it, like the mic'd up series or the play it loud stuff, things that, you know, a lot of people weren't giving, getting access for. You know, the influencer space, they have a lot of, they have that MLB influencer program now. Yeah, um, they're definitely they, trying. They, they try. And that's the thing where it's, they're always going to be slower because it's, it's such a large organization. Yeah. And that's the main reason why, you know, a lot of people ask me why I didn't enter, you know, go work for a team or why I didn't try to work for MLB or things like that. Um, and the honest truth is I want to make change and I want to make it now. Um and the best way to do that is to build something for yourself and to really invest the time and the money and the effort towards building your own platform that you can try to adjust that. And that's basically what momentum's done. Um, so yeah, it's, they get concentrated doses of it. I know they talk about certain things like, Oh, did you see this? Did you do that? Um, especially when we were doing it more in the professional space, you know, COVID made things harder just because access to players became basically none. Not, nothing. Um, and so that's where we had to pivot and we had to figure out new ways to continue to give, you know, the community that we're trying to serve content to consume and significant ideas to actually present. And so that's generally what we're doing now. And that's why we're building, you know, the fantasy factory out here in Scottsdale, like our baseball side of it. Uh, it's called close to the public, which is pretty much, uh, we had a reality show on during the off season that was called that close to the public. We wanted to be like super exclusive invite only kind of place that, you know, it's this hub of inspiration and we can continue to just push that out to the world. And then, you know, as the world gets bigger for us, we can continue to bring it kind of closer in. So, so will that one day be open to the public at all? Is that in the future uh, plans? Like, you know, maybe five, 10 years from now, but like. I would say the, the hope would be that it, it possibly could. Um, I would say we, we have, really wanted it to be you know say for guys like you that are interested in the change in the sport and like accomplishing great things and doing that this is it's the type of these conversations that we'd want to have um 
it's not something that we wanted to we would want to make open to the public like you have to pay to come here and experiences yeah or experience it like for us it's more we wanted to make it a safe haven for people who enjoy having thoughtful conversation and wanting to drive things forward yeah. so that's that would be the capacity that we're heading towards um that's really it so that's it, it's more of a a principal decision on my on our end in general that it's like to really allow people who you know don't want to be influenced by society in the way they're like oh you know it's it's kind of uh, a nerdy thing to care about it's like I don't care if, if you're passionate about something and you want to pursue it and you want to try to make it better. Let's talk about it. Yeah, definitely. Um, so that's, that's really what this place is for. And I think, I mean, we'll go back a little bit when you, uh, when, when danger asked about the, you know, helicopter parent, you said you would receive a little bit of pushback on some things. Mm-hmm. I think that's a good thing, right? Like in the, especially this day age, cause I mean, they say all good publicity is, or all, pub- all publicity is good publicity. And I, I think in Momentum's case, that is 100% true because, I mean, look at MLB now. They're doing the the play loud, like where they mic up a player in each uh, dugout. And, you know, ESPN does on Sunday night where they have a player take a mic out on live TV and they're talking yep. to a mid-game. Like, that was something that didn't happen two, three years ago at all. Yeah, I think uh, no, the, yeah. the pushback shows you guys are actually, you know, are making that change and you guys are doing something because – like you were talking about earlier, you kind of wanted to start your own thing separate from the, you know, organization. Cause I feel like it'd be a lot harder to make change. Just kind of like a soldier in the, you know, conglomerate that is the MLB versus starting up your own thing and, um, have them kind of start noticing you. And, um, you know, I think that pushback shows that, you know, there is a difference being made for sure. Yeah, that's the hope. And, you know, there's a lot of significant organizations out here that are doing a lot of great things. You know, Savannah Bananas are one of them. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people, other YouTubers out there that are trying to do cool things. Um, and the biggest thing is, you know, you see it with like the live golf tournament for PGA stuff. You see like PGA has never once thought that they were in, in jeopardy. Oh, dude, they're or, screaming right now. They're so worried. And it's stuff like that. Like, whether that situation, I don't know how it's going to work out. You know, you've seen how a lot of things have played out and money talks in many capacities and, sure. you know, that, that sort of thing. But in many capacities, MLB is still, it's a monopoly. They run, it's the only place that you can be the highest level baseball player possible and do it in the highest kind of light with the highest, uh, the biggest spotlight. Um, and so there's other, you know, when it comes to influence, the, the things that we started to see, it's like, you know, guys like Eric Sim, get recognized a bunch more than, you know, when we're out, he gets recognized more than Trevor. Um, like there's a lot of things that, you know, Eric went to a game with Johnny Gomes out in Chicago and people were just handing their phone to Johnny Gomes. Be like, Hey, can you take a picture? <laughs> they don't even know who Johnny Eric Gomes Sim. is. Johnny Gomes has won two world series. <laughs> like Johnny Gomes is probably one of the coolest baseball people out there. And and like they see Eric Sim, they're like, ah, oh, like I've seen you on YouTube. That's the future of what it is. Is like, you know, the Logan Pauls of the world and all these the Mr. Beasts and these like large YouTubers are like the Tom Cruises, uh, the Matthew McConaughey's in our world now. Yeah. Like obviously that's still there where these guys, you know, if you make a movie as great as Top Gun Maverick, like definitely you're going to be a, a a cool dude. But <laughs> like the fact that Logan Paul has as much pull as he does, especially with the younger generations, that's like the equivalent of the Brad Pitts of when I was a kid. It is. And they're making if more, if the same way more money than movie stars were 10, 15 years ago. And the influence they have is that much more significant too, because they have access to their life and they seem more, you know, accessible. And that's one of the biggest things that society has changed too. And, you know, that's what all we wanted to do is, you know, we wanted young kids and athletes that are going to be the next major leaguers to know that this is where the future is heading. You know, you have to be able to represent yourself in a new way. You can't just give the same interview to the same media members and say the same stuff. You know, there's a reason why, you know, Mike Trout will go down probably as one of the best baseball players ever. He's done the same thing over and over. And there's like, he's not the most engaging kind of personality when it comes to that. Um, But like a lot of the next guys that are coming that are going to be, you know, the next Mike Trouts of the world that really change the game from a physical standpoint, they're going to also know that, you know, the way they present themselves, the way that they 
represent themselves off the field, but the way that they engage with audience members on YouTube or all these different things, that's going to be where they have the most significance. That's what makes them a household name, even if MLB or their organization hasn't decided to, you know, give them that opportunity. Um, I, I was going to say, what do you, what is like the kind of, like, I'm trying to think of the word, what is like the current outlook of like the players right now? Like, is it kind of 50 50? I mean, obviously you're not, you know, in every clubhouse or whatever, but you know, you yeah. hang around with some professional athletes. What, like, are they pushing back? Are they, you know, hey, let's, you know, put a camera on me, like, mic me up. Like, what is the you situation know, there? It's, um, the lockout was clear that the players know that they need to push back and continue to push back. You know, the CBA still has a bunch of problems. Um, the, I'm pretty at it, like, nothing was truly solved. But I can tell you this much is that their confidence and their ability to stand up for what they want and what they believe in is definitely there. Um, you know, most aren't going to do what Trevor does. Most aren't going to do what Trevor sure. May does. Yeah. Um, you know, even guys like Alex Bregman, he put a, a vlog out during the off season. As soon as the season starts, it pretty much shuts down because it's hard to do. It's very difficult to be, you know, an entertainer and a professional athlete. Most yeah. guys just think they need to just play. Um, but you know, this is where if you start thinking of professional athletics as entertainment and like the WWE or, you know, prize fight boxing, that's where you start understanding that like for you to really build your career and for you to do this in the way that, you know, allows you to be the most profitable and allows you to capitalize on your image after the fact. And this is where NIL, like that stuff being passed in college is fantastic. Yeah. Because it's enabled athletes to actually care about this stuff and see the physical return um, you know, they can get paid now. I say that's almost actually, starting. That's like the start of the wave. And then hopefully when it breaks and crashes, by the time everyone gets to the pros, I mean, they're all 100%. some sort of, some sort of an influencer, whether it's a vlogger, a podcaster, you know, a social media yeah. person, you know, it's just, yeah. that was the start. And I've always, you know, there's so many people out there that are doing so many great things for, you know, at the end of the day, if the end goal is that you just have, bunch of professional athletes that understand their value their worth to the utmost percentage and they're able to represent that and they're able to communicate that to their employers and the people who pay their paychecks and you know at some point hopefully they can find other sustainable ways to you know support themselves there's so many ways and so many pieces of that you know there's companies like open doors that are helping college kids really understand their value and understand how to connect themselves with companies um you know, there's branding agents out there who are helping college kids do that. There's high school kids that are, you know, the fact that they're paying attention to this stuff at an early age, they're doing a bunch. Then there's college coaches. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if some of the top baseball programs out there in the next five years, one of their biggest recruiting pitches is I can help you get more money through NIL, or I can help you like learn more about image and likeness and branding and that's doing a massive job. They understand it's a recruiting tool. Then they get the best athletes. Then they get the, you know, the program gets big. I think they just have funding. to see it as a recruiting tool first. That's like the hard, like, door you have to yep. break through is like, look, like, this is a huge opportunity for all your people you're trying to recruit. 100%. And that's the, one of the biggest things we deal with, with with probably any of the companies that we're running with right now is we're ahead of the curve with the market and we're waiting for the market to catch up and, I'm, I'm very excited for the high school kids, the college kids, some of the younger, you know, minor leaguers, because they get it. Yeah. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to expect current major leaguers to really jump out of their way because they're like, I'm here, I'm doing. It's not how they came up. You got to, you know, exactly. respect that in a way. So you, and this is where, where true evolution happens in sport and in any kind of marketplace. It's your, you got like the indoctrinated, this is what's established and this is what we've been doing. And then you have the other side of it where it's like, this is a brand new evolution that's coming. And then you mix it together and you meet somewhere in the middle. Yeah. Um, that's the only way you kind of move forward. Otherwise it just becomes this, it's not a rational adult conversation. It just becomes two people who are emotionally attached to what they believe in. And then it's just all chaos. So definitely we're getting there. Does uh, long, uh, six years, does, does the future hold any other sports for momentum or has that been ever explored? Like, Hey, let's do, Obviously, you're from Canada, so you probably followed hockey, I assume, a little bit. Like, you know, it is, you know, golf, any of those. Like, has Momentum thought about expanding it all? 
Oh yeah. It's, I mean, it's one of those things where we want to serve the community that really is like devoted themselves to us Yeah, and we want to do it in an entertaining way. You know, everything we do, we do to entertain and we do to educate and empower our fans to, you know, to have better conversations with their friends, to engage, to have more fulfilling lives. That's, I mean, when it comes to a media company, that's really all you can do. Um, but that's where, you know, if you start figuring out certain ways to do that with, you know, a lot of baseball players play golf. Uh, a lot of hockey players like baseball, but they also, you know, that's part of the, partly why we built this place too, is, you know, I have a lot of friends who play NHL hockey. I have buddies that are like play golf professionally. I have like a couple of buddies that are in country music. So you, you try to create this hub for a lot of just cool people to come do, you know, I don't know if I'm allowed to swear on this, but do cool shit. Yeah. yeah, like, yeah. That's our whole, that's like our whole thing is, you know, we've transitioned to just, we're a bunch of people who like we're inspired, we're passionate and we just want to do cool shit with other people like that. So, yeah. Well, I think, uh, I think you're definitely succeeding in that, that realm of thing. That. It's, it's cool to see like just how it's grown from, I think I was a subscriber to momentum. Like when it was like under a thousand like subscribers, like I was like very early and to see what Sweet. it is now, like it's, uh, it's super cool. Just, you know, the live ABs, the, you know, seeing Eric Sim get dunked on, like all that stuff is just, it's so, so great to watch. Yeah. You guys are, uh, you guys are clearly like you were talking about, like the future and like with the influence lifestyle that's taking over to clear, you guys are on the right track with helping athletes, you know, capitalize on that stuff. Um, and you know, obviously you're going a hundred miles an hour right now, probably with everything going on with all these startup companies. I'm curious though, have you kind of taken a step back and like retrospect and, you know, being that kid from Canada who came here, started playing baseball in college and stuff. And have you taken a moment to just kind of think of like, wow, like look what we've accomplished already. And like all these pro athletes I work with who, when I was little, I'd probably be, you know, shit in my pants knowing where I am now with these guys. Sure. Um, you know, it's funny, the, the main times that that's occurred is I got my citizenship in September and that took forever. And it's like, like I said, it was like one of the first dreams I ever actually saw physically. My parents, that's, you know, they sacrificed everything for that to accomplish, like to actually be accomplished. And, you know, I was the first one in my family to get an American college degree. Um, you know, there's been times like that, but I would say the biggest times lately um, September, when I got my citizenship, I really took a look in the mirror and like, you know, compared to where I was and what I'm at now, it's part of the reason why I'm as vocal as I am about, you know, loving this country and the opportunities that I've had. Like, I wouldn't have been able to accomplish what I have if I was still in Canada. That's just not the case. Like, and you, any immigrant you talk to, United States remains the, the place that you come to, to pursue dreams, no matter what those dreams are. And you have the opportunity to accomplish them. You, you can't say that about any other country. Um, and that's, you know, the biggest thing for me. And it's, you know, I, I actually thought about it July 4th. Everyone, you know, it's fun. We had a barbecue at my house. You know, I'm, I'm getting married in October. So I have my fiance there. I have my dog. You know, this is my home. I have, you know, this large group of people that's a part of our different companies. And it's part of our community. And they're all at the house celebrating. And it is it's one of those things where you never think about like, that's the end goal or that's what you're trying to accomplish. But it's a very, it's the little things, you know, I was sitting there like I was flipping burgers and looking around and everyone's enjoying themselves. And it's like, this is just, you've built this great community of people. And I, to be honest, if you were to ask me what my number one job is in building these companies and what I, it's to influence and it's to bring together the best team of people possible to help in that influence. And that's, that's really what's the the biggest thing that I've learned in my prof like professional career so far is that's what I'm meant to do. So I've, I've had a few moments to answer your question. That's pretty, that's pretty awesome. Like just to think about like, and like, yeah, maybe it's like a short term goal. Cause I think like you guys are just getting started. Obviously you only have hit one sport pretty hard and not even made a full impact yet. Like it's the impact is still in the next, you know, three, four years of generation of players. So it's pretty cool yeah. to see. Uh, kind of wrap oh, up you. here. What's what's in store, you know, for your future, for Momentum's future, for app, you know, everything going on. Sure. Uh, you know, the biggest thing, obviously, number one is getting this facility done because it allows us to, you know, it's going to be pretty sweet. It has a bunch of different opportunities for a lot of people to come and can do you, stuff inside of it. Can you explain what 
more has to be done? Because at least watching videos, it looks like sure. a pretty complete facility. Yep. So from the, the physical nature of it, a lot of the cages are done and a lot of that stuff. It's more the now the office space needs to be finished and it's going to be more, you know, <laughs> if I was to show you, I, I mean, you've probably seen some of the videos where like Kevin, one of our chief editors, or Cole, one of our new creators, where like, it's actually where all of our desks are. Um, it's all in the middle of the floor. I would say and it's just kind of like I'm right used. out there, right? Yeah. And that's, that's what I'm used to. That's what like old driveline was, is like you'd throw what my, my desk was literally next to the biomechanics lab <laughs> at the facility in driveline. And I would always be asked like, Hey, so what are you working on? I'm like, I'm on a call with the guy in Japan. Like I'm not doing anything related to what you're doing, but I was right <laughs> next to the biomechanics lab. Yeah. Right? So that's, that's what I'm used to. But I do think once this place is finished from a you know aesthetic standpoint, we're able to accomplish a lot more. We're able to put, we're going to have like a fun area with like a pool table and like guys to hang out. It's going to be more that I want to create more of that, conversation content too where you know in real life stuff is really good but it's the lessons you learn from it too and the people that are through it um so that's that's like one of the more significant things that needs to finish which enables us to you know from momentum the big thing is you know we've made this shift towards everything we do is going to be cool everything we do is like we want baseball to be the most fun talked about sport possible you know it needs it, that it needs to it needs to be some sort of, you know, exciting piece to it. You know, we just put out a video the other day of us trying to hit a paintball gun, yep. like paintballs flying. And that's, you know, it's stuff like that where it's like baseball myth busters type stuff. Um, it's also, you know, we're going to, I love playing the game of baseball and wherever it may be. You know, I tried, I just dislocated my finger yesterday <laughs> trying to catch a 90 mile an hour pitch with a glove I made for less than a hundred dollars. Is that a video coming like, up? Is that like inside? Yep, that's uh, that's coming, and you know, <laughs> by the time this is probably posted, the video will be out, and you'll see how, like, I surprised myself. I didn't know it was out, and then all of a sudden, I went and like fixed the glove to because I was pissed, oh. and then I just felt my finger get back into place. Mm. So that's what this is for. Um, but like doing this cool stuff, you know, this is it is a dream to be able to call this partially your job, and to empower others to like do this because it's not your typical nine to five. Uh, it's definitely not something you see at career day. Um, no, not at but all. That's what we're trying to, that's what we're trying to do over the next, you know, six, 12 months is to continue to create really good content and to inspire others to do fun stuff. You know, I, every so often, whenever Eric goes out to a field and he gets recognized, like, you know, these kids are wanting to throw ga like gas for cash. It's like, we want kids to throw hard, hit bombs, do all this stuff, you know, on Kevin's side, you know, maybe they need to learn to bunt because they'll be better <laughs> baseball players. They learn how to bunt. So, you know, that's, that's really from the momentum side is to continue to create inspirational, entertaining content that you know, empowers people to be who they are and support what they want to support. Um, and then obviously for four app, it's the same thing. You know, we have a lot of tools in play that, you know, we're constantly, when it comes to minor leaguers, we have quite a few minor leaguers that work with our director of athletic performance. His name's Tim Naiman. Um, does a great job interfacing with minor leaguers, major leaguers that we have. Um, you know, it's, it's one of those things where we don't really promote who uses our stuff um, because it's not for us to do. We really just want to support uh, the athletes in being better athletes and their physiological makeup and helping kind of push that forward and evolve it. Um, and then the secondary piece, 4App has an app out there that's public uh, that basically is the public representation of the tools we've refined uh, for general public use. So, you know, a kid can throw a bullpen and he can track his command and then he can understand how his miss patterns go. So then he can also do a subjective questionnaire where he understands, okay, like starts to learn the data driven process of an athlete, yeah. which, you know, if I was to fast forward 30 years and look back and be like, Hey, if there's one thing I wish I accomplished is I hope athletes are smarter and more empowered and they know what will actually help them get to the highest levels of the game in the easiest way, you know, my, my road to wherever, whatever level of baseball I got to, um, was, it was a very roundabout way of doing it. Uh, and I want it to be way more streamlined and figured out for the younger generations. It sounds like, uh, it sounds like you guys at least have a plan on how to do that. And you guys are executing very, yeah. very astoundingly. So it's, it's a plan built off of variable change. That's I wish I was like a little eager when momentum first started. Cause dude, my baseball career would probably be so different. 
I, I can tell you, I would never try to hit the ball on the ground. No, I was, That's, uh, yeah. I don't know if you know who Matt Davidson is. Uh, oh, yeah. see, so he was my hitting coach in little league. I went to the same high school as him and him and Taiwan Walker as well. But I remember yep. like going to like little league hitting coach with him and in his like backyard batting cage after he got drafted that he built to train kids and like, you know, bottom two thirds of the ball, it'll go just be a pop-up top two thirds will give you the backspin and then you're going to hit home runs. And it's like. It was just crazy. Like that's like the one of the only things I remember from like little league. Mm -hmm. It was pretty nuts. Well, I can tell you the biggest thing is, you know, as much as they're trying to tell you that you know, put the ball on the ground and run. No one gave a shit. I did that better than anyone, and no one cared. As soon as I started hitting home runs and started like doing that stuff, that's where the action runs, is. I mean, oh, well, that's it's that's what's scalable. Yeah, like that's the the biggest thing. And like you, the way that I can say. Driveline has accomplished some great things in player development. There's a bunch of player development companies out there, third party, that have accomplished some great things. You know, anyone who's made it open source, anyone who's brought in athletes and like has really made it a focus of theirs to, I would say, more engage with the athlete and educate them rather than just like spoon feed them everything. You know, that's some of the stuff that's driven the sport forward. And it's just created a much smarter community of young kids that, you know, they're, uh, they're going to accomplish great things. So that's what I'm really excited for. Cool, man. Well, I appreciate you coming on. Where can uh, where can we find you and, and the rest of the, uh, I guess, all the momentum? You want to plug it? Sure. So uh, obviously watch Momentum on YouTube. That's probably the biggest place. You'd find all of our, uh, our social media accounts out there. All of mine is like underscore Tosher underscore. Uh, I, I talk more about, you know, business of baseball stuff i'm cool i'm probably one of the least more active guys uh but obviously king of juco trevor bauer channer prize which is kevin chan and then dude's a dude who's cole lacaranti and then tim Naiman. i got a lot of guys to call out so <laughs> cool uh if you love the future of baseball that's where everyone is yeah awesome man well i appreciate it uh yeah, thanks for coming stay on the line we'll chat for just a second if you got the time and then uh you got it yeah if you want to wrap it up danger yeah, thanks again for coming on. Uh, we're super excited to see where momentum and all you guys uh, take baseball into the future. Um, make sure to check out Watch Momentum, everything he just plugged. Until next time, you never know.